Europa FM, pe aceeași frecvență cu tine. Astăzi la misiunea Verde încercăm să vedem în ultima emisiune din acest sezon lucrurile bune din jurul nostru și să învățăm de la ele. Și o să mergem până în Danemarca, o țară care a reușit să stabilească noi recorduri și să marcheze record după record în ceea ce privește sustenabilitatea, clădirile inteligente, standardele privind apa curată și energia verde. O țară despre care vorbim întotdeauna cu respect în momentul în care ne uităm la mobilitate și vedem cât s-au îmbrățișat transportul pe două roți cu bicicleta sau cât de repede se adoptă mașinile electrice și hibrid acolo. Pentru a înțelege fenomenul și mai ales pentru a vedea ceea ce putem apleca în România, stăm de vorbă astăzi la misiunea verde la Europa FM cu excelența sa, domnul ambasador Soren Jensen. Bun venit la Europa FM! Thank you very much. Well, the environment and, and of course also the energy and the situation and the climate situation actually started out of necessity. If we go back to the energy crisis in the 1970s, Denmark was very severely hit by the energy crisis. At that time, we were 100% dependent on oil from the Middle East, from foreign imports. Uh, and we were hit completely by the boycott that happened in 1972. This resulted in a policy change in Denmark where we started relying on our own resources. This was first of all uh, natural resources in the in the uh, in the sea around us, uh, the North Sea gases from there, in particularly and oil. But over time, we also started adapting to the realization that we needed to go away from fossil fuels and find more reliable energy sources. And today we have a much stronger uh, commitment to, to this effort. We have, first of all, energy independence. We've had that for a number of years. And we're moving from fossil fuels, quite determined from moving away from fossil fuels and to sustainable energy sources, primarily wind, solar power uh, as, the main, as the main sources, but using these uh, two sources to also produce other kinds of alternative energy sources, sustainable. It's more expensive in the beginning, so there was a need for uh, for some kinds of subsidies and assistance. Um, but I think the 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 the, the, um, the interesting part about the Danish experience is that it was actually a, a triangular cooperation. There was there are three parts to this, and without that, it didn't work. First of all, there was a public demand for change. People wanted a better environment. People wanted a better climate. People have understood and are uh, concerned about the, the effects of climate change. At our last elections uh, two years ago, we had actually climate as one of the main issues for many, especially young people, when they decided who to vote for. So the public uh, interest, the public demand for, for change has been strong. The government reaction has been strong. There's been a broad political consensus in Denmark that we need to change, we need to go more green. This means that the investments are long-term. They don't change when the government changes. When Once the investments are planned, they are carried through. And there's a very strong collaboration with the private sector. The regulators, the legislators, the government, the parliament makes rules, makes uh, designs, uh, uh, requirements. These requirements are then fulfilled by the, by the sector, by the industrial sector, by the technological sector, the universities develop the technologies with the companies. The companies implement the technologies and you get a system that, that works. This has advantages for Denmark nationally. But of course, it also helps our companies when they want to export uh, their know-how and knowledge uh, abroad. Well, Denmark is famous for our very high taxes on cars, I have to say, but, uh, and yes, we do actually. We, so there have been uh, subsidies or lower, lower uh, taxes on electric car vehicles or on hybrid car vehicles to, to help the introduction of this into the market. Also, the, the government and, and the private sector are working uh, closely together to uh, promote, of course, um, chargers to place them in the country so that it becomes relevant and possible to use your electric car. The latest development is another uh, private uh, initiative where chargers, the company producing the chargers, are working with a large retailer 
uh, supermarket chain to make sure that around the, these supermarkets, chargers are placed uh, so that their customers will go to the supermarket and can charge their cars in the process while they shop, basically. No, not, not, not this. You, we've had some scrapping of, of, of really old bad cars, uh, some subsidies, but not subsidies for, for electric cars. But since the tax is, is so relatively high, a lower tax in, a, in essence works the same way as a subsidy, you can say. Uh, not, not, not paying them for it. No, we do have incentives for uh, for companies to take back the the, the electric equipment. I, mean, I think there's also on the at the EU level there are initiatives to, to to that the companies actually have a responsibility to to help get rid of the products that they have uh, they have sold people, especially if they have a large environmental impact. Uh, and and there's a lot of energy possibility of saving because you can recycle, reuse some of the precious metals, for example, that are in the. Uh, in these products, which again will save imports, <clears throat> which again of course saves transport and there's, so there's a lot of win-win situations here. Well I think it's, it's a combination of actually pricing things, uh, energy, people will tend to do what is the, the most economical thing to do because people are generally sensible, they, they, do, they do not want to pay more than they have to. So energy and energy prices, of course, is one of the most sensitive uh, aspects of this. So you need to put a price on black energy, on bad you know, coal, on, on energy that, that uh, pollutes, but also uh, creates uh, climate change, uh, uh, contributes to climate change. So that's one of the aspects, which also means that you have to do, make it more interesting and relevant and economically viable to buy green energy. Now, this used to be so you have subsidies for, to, to promote, as you said, the green energy. In Denmark and, and actually even in Romania today, it's not necessary. Green energy is a good investment already now. <clears throat> it's, 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 you don't need extra subsidies to produce wind in, in a country like Romania. Um, the government actually doesn't need to subsidize private producers of energy to actually start producing wind or even solar power because it is already economically viable. It's cheaper today to produce wind or solar power than it is to produce coal. But the initial investment, it's quite big. Well, the initial investment is, yes, but even with the invest initial investment, you still it's still cheaper to produce uh, than, for example, if you invest in new coal power plants. What you sometimes need to do, of course, is to extend and expand and develop the grid, the electrical grid, Uh, and there are many things here that that, that you know that the technological development will, will cater to, but it has to do with adjusting the the grid so it becomes more like a smart grid, so that you utilize different periods of the day when wind, for example, is more or less, where solar is more or less. Uh, these are things that that the technologies that uh, our companies and other international companies are still working on. But the big picture is still that if you put the right price on things, consumers will also uh, will also go the green way. I can give you another example of where the, the Danish government has actually um, given subsidies. It is um, one of the more economical ways of running a private home nowadays is with the so-called heat pumps. Basically, these heat pumps pull in warmth from the air outside and, and warm the house, or in the summer they do the opposite. They, cool down the house with the same technology. Um, for example, my neighbors where I live in Denmark have uh, introduced a heat pump to their house, put solar panels on the roof of their house. The solar panels essentially provide the electricity to run the heat pump. So there is no, except for the investment, they don't have a running, not very much anyway, of a running cost to actually run the heat pump. There, were, there was a subsidy given to them. Of course, they were still a, of an investment they had to do, but that investment is being paid back over a period of time. And right now, because of the very high increase in gas prices, my neighbors are sitting in their house, nice and warm, looking at their investment becoming actually better and better compared to my house, which is still heated by gas, uh, because I pay uh, three or four times more uh, for the energy bill.
Well, we, we you can say we prepared for it since the first energy crisis we experienced <clears throat> with the uh, with the, with the oil back in the 1970s, simply by having substituted uh, energy sources, sustainable ones that we have on other sources. We are, of course, still dependent, as as, as most of Europe still unfortunately is, on gas, uh, and gas for many countries is also a transitional. Um, f- source of energy towards going more green, and let's and gas is better than coal for sure. But over time, our our, our ambition is also to get rid of, of gas. We have ambitions to be seventy um, percent CO two uh, neutral in uh, twenty thirty. The EU goal is fifty five. So uh, we are more ambitious than the EU here, and of course we all have the ambition by twenty fifty to be completely carbon neutral, which means that also gas has been uh, has been phased out. Well, I think I think it's easy to if you want to see the the negative sides, it's very easy to find them. Of course, you can be disappointed. A lot of young people were very ambitious. A lot of uh, green movements have been very ambitious, and I think they should be ambitious and they should make demands on the politicians. Um, of course, the, <clears throat> the politicians and the leaders of the large nations, especially maybe the large developing nations, who have populations who are also making demands on increasing growth, getting out of poverty, improving their life conditions so that they resemble the ones we, we know here, but they, of course, have to look into that reality. And if they take steps that are too quick, they may get in trouble at home. So I, I believe that we did make progress in, in COP26. The fact alone that we had everyone there, that no one in any serious way was questioning the, uh, the science. Everyone acknowledges uh, that the science is there, that we are creating this crisis, uh, man is creating this crisis. That that's important because that that's that's really necessary if we want to change. That we acknowledge that we're actually behind this, and I think there were results. I mean, even the coal was not as ambi- the coal agreement was not as uh, ambitious as we may have wanted it to be. There still was one, and there still is a commitment now from all the large emitters to to reduce the use of coal and also to use different kinds of coal, coal that is less uh, pollutant and, and less uh, damaging to, to climate. There were good agreements on forestry, deforestation, avoiding this because this is also a very important side of it. And there were a number of other, of, of other good solutions. And the fact that every country there presented uh, plans for how they, they want to introduce uh, changes that will accommodate this is, is positive. On the very small scale, but still just as a symbolic, uh, Greenland, which is part of, of Denmark, uh, but has its own uh, autonomy when it comes to, for example, energy issues, uh, also committed to uh, to reducing climate, although they are, their contribution to the climate is extremely small. But of course, they are one of the areas that feel the effects of climate change. If you go to Greenland, I've been there, you can see how the gletsers literally have receded over the last 20, 30 years. You can stand in, in, in one of the fjords, and they will tell you, look, look at the pictures from 30 years ago. The Gletscher was where we are standing now. And now you can see it's, it's 10, maybe 5 kilometers further away, simply because it has melted. And this is not a natural phenomenon. This is a man-made event. Well, I, I, in Denmark, it's, it's, we've always used the bikes. Actually, we had the bikes before we had the cars, and people never stopped using the bikes. Um, we have the advantage in Denmark, of course, that it's, it's flat. It's, it's relatively flat country, so we don't have a lot of... It's easy to use the bike. On the other hand, it's, always, it's also very windy, and it's, it rains, so you know people get used to this. But, but it wasn't the fact that we had to encourage people to use the bikes. People have always used the bikes. And in a large city like Copenhagen, the bike can can often be quicker than the car. We have uh, bike lanes uh, on all, uh, ma- mainly all the main roads in, in Copenhagen, for example. There are bike lanes, quite you know, good bike lanes. Sometimes there is also traffic jams on the bike lanes. You have traffic jams in the car lanes, but you also have traffic jams in the in the bike lanes. And if you have ever tried to be a tourist in Denmark, you also know that you should be very careful. And not to step out on the bike lanes because, uh, first of all, of course, you can get hit and get hurt, but also you'll get very angry reactions from from people who bike. And and it is really like um, you know, it's it's not like a 
let's say it's it's not a leisure thing to bike. It's it's serious business. You 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 get to work. You want to get to work on let's say five minutes or ten minutes. You go really fast on your bike. Uh, and of course, for a lot of people, biking is also a way of keeping fit because if they if you bike, let's say twenty uh, kilometers to work, which some people do. They, it's a good way of staying fit, you know, because you're moving your your body. And ma ma main most bikes today are not these electric bikes. They're still the old-fashioned, as we call it, the the bread motor, which is basically the legs pushing the the bike ahead, you know. Well, I think. On, 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 on water, we've always prized ourselves of having clean, clean drinking water. Actually, unfortunately, we are we're experiencing now in a few places, at least, the, um, the impact of agriculture, but also of industrial production. In certain places, the water has to be now be, be treated more before, uh, before you could drink it. Before, in most places, and still in, in, in most places, you can simply drink the tap water without any, any treatment, and it's, it's healthy and it's, uh, it's clean. But there are a few places where, where we are unfortunately seeing the impact. And this is something that has a huge effect. It's simply part of the Danish mentality that you can turn on the tap and drink the water. You don't have to buy bottled waters in the, in the, uh, in the supermarkets. <clears throat> but another thing we've done, which I think is, is remarkable, is Copenhagen, of course, is a, as the name says, Hagen is a haven, is a hound in Denmark, is a harbor, is, is an old harbor town. We had a large industrial harbor for, for centuries, basically. This water has been turned completely clean. The water has been, the harbor has been cleansed. The emissions have been stopped or cleaned and made sure that, that what comes out is actually clean, uh, which means that nowadays the Copenhagen Harbor is used as a recreational area. People are literally swimming in the harbor every every summer. I was, uh, I noticed it really last year. I went for, with my children and, and did a tour around Copenhagen. And the whole harbor front was full of people lying and taking sun and swimming and having fun in the water, which was unthinkable 20 years ago or 30 years ago because the water was, was quite bad and polluted. So it, is, it shows that it is possible to clean up the environment where it has been damaged um, and you get, you get the possibility of using it for recreational, in this case, uh, areas. And, and people love it. You know, it's a, it's a great place to, when you live in a big city, instead of having to go, you know, with transport, like all the way to Constanza to, to, to go to the beach. Imagine if you could actually find, uh, I know that you don't have a harbor in Bucharest, but, you know, there are other options that there you can plans. actually swim in, uh, swim in the harbor in this case. Then this is something you can do in, in a, lot of other, you know, a lot of other cities and something we're quite proud of in Copenhagen. Well, well. I, firstly, yes. The, we have we've done <clears throat> over the last three years a, a Christmas a Christmas song, which we recorded. The embassy recorded together with uh, good friends, um, and we did it for uh, for charity. Uh, the idea was that we would encourage people to donate to. In this place, was the Magic Association, uh, and it has been a fairly big success. I have to say. I think one of the first years when we were able to measure it, we we got around thirty three thousand euros. Uh, <clears throat> donated to, to Magic Camp. So this was something we felt very proud of. The reason we do it this way, of course, is that as a small embassy, <clears throat> we don't have a lot of resources. We don't have money we can we can give away. We do have the image of an embassy, which most people connect with being very formal and wearing suits and ties and going to receptions and, you know, being very <laughs> elevated. So we thought it was an interesting thing to show a different side of being an embassy, which, which is also to be creative, to be helpful and to try to create awareness. Now this year, uh, because of the whole climate situation and the debate we have on alternative energy, also the debate going on here in Romania, uh, the targets we have set ourselves in the European Union to reach carbon neutrality in 2050 and 55% reductions in 2030, this is also a, a commitment Romania has entered into. Uh, in Romania, the, the public debate is very different from the one in Denmark. We don't see the same to the same extent in Romania a public demand for change. There are there are green organizations, 
but still the, the, the public awareness around these things are perhaps not as, as great as we have seen in other countries. And of course, understandably, there are not other concerns. People have concerns with the COVID crisis, with the energy prices, with, with other things, you know, here in, in Romania, it's a different situation. Nevertheless, if change is going to happen and if Europe is going to meet its commitments, also Romania needs to, 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 uh, to do more. Romania is not the worst because of you, have, you have actually sustainable energy with hydro power and other things. But still, there are still improvements to be made, especially getting rid of, of coal here in Romania. So the idea this year was to do another Christmas song, a different one actually than the other years. And this year, so this year, the theme is about uh, climate and uh, uh, making awareness around the, the threats and the problems around climate change. So we've tried to construct a song that on one hand is, is worry, worry, we have to do something, as you know. <laughs> and the other, on the other hand, uh, of course, still has the message of Christmas and yeah, let's enjoy that we have Christmas together um, while we still do something about the climate. So that's sort of the idea. It's, uh, hopefully a, a tune that people will like and, and will help them remember, okay, we need, to, we need to act on this climate issue. Well, I think, I think, I think Romania, as I said, has, has already done some, something. You have the advantage of having a lot of hydroelectric power. Which is which is sustainable energy, uh, so that that's actually very very useful for you. You also have uh, you also have already done solar. There were ten years ago there was a lot of, sorry a lot of sustainable energy with wind, and increasingly also solar power. So there are things that are already being done in Romania. I think some of the th one of the things you can you can focus on with with that can be done fairly quickly. Um, is utilizing some of the technologies we have we have developed, helped develop, when it comes to energy saving. Because even, okay, if you use the black energy, of course, it's good to use as little as possible. But even when we use green energy, it's still good to use as little energy as possible, to save it, to conserve it, so we don't waste it. Um, and here, energy efficiency is, is one of these aspects to, to, to look at especially buildings. Buildings, uh, half or, or almost half, 40% of the CO2 emissions globally come from buildings. We think it's cars and other things, but actually buildings are actually more uh, contributing to global warming than, than even than cars. So what we can do in buildings uh, is a lot. Um, and Denmark has a lot of experience here, Isol insulating the buildings in ways that, 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 that so the heat doesn't leave the building through the windows, through the walls. Um, we have examples of, of retrofitting um, and renovating hospitals, for example, in uh, Croatia. Hospitals that are very comparable to your hospitals. The, the case I'm thinking about, this was a hospital from 1965, 337,000 square meters. So it's a typical regional hospital also in Romania. The hospital was renovated in the ways I described. Um, the savings were, were enormous. The, uh, the savings of, of energy was 50%, simply 50% reduction in what the cost of energy, 50% uh, fewer CO2 emissions, 75, 75% saving in water consumption in a hospital. On top of that, you had, uh, you know, of course, because of the renovation, you had improved sanitation issues. You had improved fire safety standards because you used, uh, they used um, stone wool insulation instead of polystyrene, for example. That is, you cannot, it simply cannot burn because it's made of stone. So, so these kind of fairly simple uh, methods can be used to, to renovate buildings. The technologies are there. The technologies are even here in Romania. The stone wool producer is here in Romania. The, uh, the pipe producers, the, uh, the pump producers are, here, are also here in Romania. The companies are here. So these are, these are solutions that can, be, that can be introduced fairly quickly. The financing, Romania has a lot of money, 29.3 billion euros from the European Union under the PNRR. Um, <clears throat> but also these, these things can still be done even, even um, as private uh, projects. The model actually uh, involves paying off the investment by the savings. So the hospital would pay the same energy price until the investment has been paid off. In the Croatian case, it was over 10 years. A 10, year, a 10 million euro investment was paid off over, I think it was 10 years, maybe it was even less. Um, but after which the, the hospital gains all the savings. So this is another way of, of, of doing sort of a, a simple project. 
We're working with um, Romanian institutions and hoping to work with even more to try to realize some of these projects here in Romania as a, like a first, like a like a project, like a, um, a test project, a showcase to see how it can be done, and then hopefully this will this can spread and there can be new and similar projects. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you soon with new projects and to discuss about them. Thank you. Europa FM, pe aceeași frecvență cu tine.